Hi everyone, welcome to the Yale 20 module on the approach to a patient with pleural effusion. My name is Dennis. And I'm Jeff. And we're going to take you through how to take care of a patient when they come in with a pleural effusion. So the way we do things at Yale 20 is that we have these certain categories that we go through. So the first is the five-minute bedside assessment. So when you see a patient and they first come in with the specific problem, how do you assess them very quickly and how do you triage them? Second is the diagnostic workup. Third is treatment plan. And then fourth, which is really important to us, is teaching you guys how to write a good assessment and plan so that you can summarize information, synthesize your clinical reasoning, and then also present it in a coherent fashion. Starting off with the five-minute bedside assessment, fundamental question is, how sick is my patient? When you have a patient who comes in with shortness of breath and they're found to have a pleural effusion, either by chest x-ray or through physical exams, you suspect one, you have to think about what are the parameters that I'm using to triage this patient. So three things that we propose are first, respiratory status. So is this causing them to not be able to exchange oxygen effectively or not be able to ventilate effectively? Has this happened on a really rapid time course? Is it a new effusion that's built up very quickly or is it something that has gone on for a while? And then the fluid amount, regardless of how fast the fluid has accumulated, if there's a lot of fluid in the chest cavity, that will then lead back to compromising the respiratory status. We love using this uh, stoplight to give you an idea of how to triage. So red is usually what we use for patients who need a higher level of care. Yellow, patients who need inpatient, probably management or investigation. And green is mostly patients who can be managed as an outpatient basis, so not needing admission to the hospital. So in pleural fusions, if they're in respiratory failure, then they definitely qualify for the red category. If they have a new effusion of unknown etiology, so no one's ever found this effusion before and now it's there, and you suspect, based on your clinical judgment, there may be something else going on, that's in a yellow category, probably in inpatient management. And finally, if you have known etiology and chronic effusions, then these are things that can be made, managed in an outpatient. So as you can see, respiratory failure, red, most likely transferred to medical ICU where they can be monitored very closely and possibly get intubation for mechanical ventilation. If they're new effusion, unknown etiology, then they can be admitted to the floor for diagnostic workup primarily. And then chronic small effusions with a known etiology can be managed outpatient in clinic. And one of the questions that people often ask is, you know, when do I need to do a thoracentesis? And if you've got that green patient, the one with small effusions, they're chronic and they're a known etiology, and you think you can treat them non-invasively, then that's fine. But I think, just like Dennis was saying, if you have a red or yellow category, someone who has ICU needs or a new or large effusion, then you're going to be looking at doing a diagnostic procedure. So some of this comes down to the amount, the duration, and the fluid distribution of your pleural effusion. If you've got a large amount of fluid, a new effusion, where the distribution is unilateral, or there are other concerning features, you're likely going to need to do a procedure. And then the question becomes, do I do the lower risk diagnostic procedure or the higher risk but more effective therapeutic procedure? One of the most important things that you do is take a history and physical. So when you see a patient and you know they have an effusion, you want to think about what are the other information they can get from a history and physical that can make me differentiate between transitative versus exudative versus either uh, effusion early on. This is really important because you do very different things based on whether it's transitative or an exudative effusion. So the first thing is history. So you ask them questions about their pulmonary history, any of the underlying pathology that they might have in their lungs, or any just systemic illnesses that they might have that could give you an idea of what's going on with that patient. The second thing is a physical exam. So three things that we look at. Dullness to percussion, absence of fremitus, uh, diminished or absent breath sounds on one or both sides. One way that I like to use very visual sort of uh, illustrations and clear versus cloudy. Clear is when you have a transitive effusion, which is a little less severe, and then cloudy is something that's exudative, which is something that you might want to jump on a little more quickly. So this is just a flow chart giving you an idea of the possible 
differentials that you can have. The green, transitive, red, exudative, black for either. And if you have a physical exam that suggests a volume overload picture with jugular venous distension, S3 gallop, or peripheral edema, then you think about primarily cardiac process, congestive heart failure, and you can use laboratory values that we have in the middle to kind of support or decrease the possibility for that diagnosis. So in this case, BNP. Second, ascites. So if you have a patient who presents with that, then you can think about cirrhosis as a possibility. And this would be a transitive effusion with these other laboratory values that support that diagnosis. Things are a little more difficult to tease out with just a physical exam are pulmonary embolism and malignancy. So for pulmonary embolism, if you do see a right ventricular heave, thrombophobitis, or signs of right heart strain, then you can think about pulmonary embolism, and then a D-dimer could be helpful. For malignancy, this is a very nonspecific presentation, but if you do see lymphadenopathy, platyspilomegaly, and you have an elevated LDH, all of these things could suggest a malignancy. And so what we're talking about here with these transgenative and exudative processes, transgenative processes are those that cause fluid to leak out because of some sort of distortion in body mechanics. Exudative processes, which can be localized to the pleural space itself, or systemic processes, are generally inflammatory in nature, occasionally of infectious or malignant ideology. And so when we think about evaluating these, what we're really talking about is Light's criteria. Now, Dr. Light was good enough to spend part of his fellowship going around the hospital doing all the thoracic and TCs and using that data to try to see if there was any patterning that could be discerned between exudative and transudative processes. And what he came up with is this. If you have either a pleural fluid LDH greater than 0.6, a protein greater than 0.5, or an LDH, which is two-thirds the upper limit of normal, then you've got yourself an exudative process. It does not require all three. And in fact, it requires all three of those to be negative to be declared transudative. There are additional tests you can order if you're suspecting an exudative process, which include cholesterol or looking for a total LDH greater than 200. Both of those are highly sensitive in determining an exudative effusion. So we're thinking about the fluid now. We're evaluating the fluid. We've looked at our patient. What tests do we need to order? Well, obviously, we need that LDH and the total protein for light's criteria. In addition to that, we want to look at the cell count, the gram stain, cultures of the fluid, a pH, and a total glucose of the pleural fluid itself. There are also specialized tests you can order if you suspect tuberculosis, pancreatic disease, or Borjov syndrome, or if there is a malignancy, you may want to send any additional fluid for flow cytometry looking for abnormal cellularity. So certainly there are concerning features. pH is less than 7.2 or glucose is less than 60 often require surgical chest tube drainage or possibly small bore chest tube drainage placed by the pulmonary consultant. You do not really need to order ANAs or rheumatoid factors as both of those have high false positive rates and are not likely to help you in addition to your other studies. And finally, you want to take a good look at the cellularity of your fluid. High red cell counts or a spun hematocrit greater than 50% can often indicate a hemothorax, especially in the correct clinical setting. And then you want to get a very good look at those white cells. So are we talking about a neutrophilic process, a lymphocytic process, or even a predominantly eosinophilic process, each of which has a different differential diagnosis? Our clinical pearl in this case is the fact that investigative cytology often requires multiple thoracentesis to turn positive. And so you can see that if you have a strong suspicion for cancer, you may need to repeat that tap one, two, or even three times. So going back to our framework for thinking about pleural effusions, we think about it as either a transitative or exudative process. And then based on that data, then we can form our differential diagnoses. So first with transitative processes, we think about three contributing organ systems. So the heart, the liver, and the kidney. We already talked about congestive heart failure as being a cause for pleural effusions that are transudative, cirrhosis as well, and stage liver disease leading to fluid leakage into that pleural space. And we didn't talk about is end-stage renal disease, which can lead to transudative process in the pleural space. For exudative processes, these are the ones that require more active management. So when we think about it, we think about it localized or systemic. 
Localized are usually more common, and they include infection, malignancy, and intra-abdominal etiologies. Systemic, a little less common, but there's still death could be present. Malignancy, inflammatory, and iatrogenic, or things that we do to our patients. So this next slide, we want to make it more of a reference slide. It has a lot of information, so we're going to go through examples of things that you might think of within these two categories. So again, we're focusing on exudative pleural fusions only, localized versus systemic. So for localized infections, either within the lung itself or in the pleural space. For malignancy, you can think about lung cancers, asbestos exposures with mesothelioma, or other more rare processes cause pleural effusion. And finally, intra-abdominal. So this could include pancreatitis, ascites, or hepatic abscesses, either subphrenic, splenic, or anywhere around the diaphragm. For systemic malignancies, hematologic malignancies are associated with pleural effusions that are exudative. For inflammation, systemic inflammation, or autoimmune processes, I know that we love writing this over here. It's not lupus, but it could actually be lupus in this case. And then iatrogenic can include radiation therapy or the post-cardiac injury syndrome. Treatment depends on diagnosis. This is where diagnosis is so important because it will guide exactly what you do. So for local exudative effusions, then you think about paraneumonic effusions primarily. If they're uncomplicated, then you can just give IV antibiotics. But if they're complicated, which means that their pH is less than 7.2 or glucose is less than 60, or they have septations or have loculated separations within the collection itself, then you may need to place a chest tube and consult surgery to do that for you. For malignancy, you usually palliate symptoms, and you may do serial thoracentesis for that, or you may even place a pleurex catheter. Finally, for intra-abdominal, you would think about just treating the underlying condition because that's the cause of whatever you're seeing up in the chest cavity. For systemic, everything, whether it's malignancy, inflammatory, or iatrogenic, you want to treat the underlying condition because without taking that away, you're going to continue to have the effusions build up. And I'll just add here that the one exception to these rules are if you're dealing with something that's truly causing mechanical obstruction to the respiratory process. So if the effusion is so large that the person's becoming hypoxic or hypercarbic, you may need to drain it regardless of etiology. So now we look at the assessment and plan and how we're going to write this patient up. And I think what you'll see here is a reasonable write-up of both the assessment and your plan for the pleural effusion. So this hypothetical patient, Mr. M, is a 59-year-old former shipyard worker with a greater than 20-pack year smoking history who presents with fever, productive cough, and increasing shortness of breath times three days. The chest radiograph shows a left-sided consolidation with a unilateral pleural effusion. And your plan for that pleural effusion is based on the diagnostic slash therapeutic thoracentesis that you have performed. Based on those findings, the effusion is exudative, likely complicated paranemonic effusion, but you're also considering malignancy given the extensive smoking history and the occupational exposure to asbestos. Light's criteria on the fluid already obtained demonstrated an LDH ratio greater than 0.6, a total protein ratio greater than 0.5, a pH less than 7.2, and a glucose less than 60, all of which show a exudative effusion with concerning features. Surgery has been called for chest tube placement, and the fluid is also sent for cell count, gram stain, culture, and flow cytometry. So bringing it back together, take them points, five-minute bedside assessment, you assess the respiratory status, and then you triage the patient according to the onset and severity of the pleural effusion. For a diagnostic, determine whether or not they need a thoracentesis, and if they do, then you send the initial serum and pleural lab work, first for lights criteria, and then for the exudative workup. And your differential should be based on the fluid. If it's exudative, then you think local versus systemic. If it's transudative, you think of the three organ systems that we mentioned previously, the heart, the liver, and the kidneys. Treatment is based on diagnosis or based on compromising the respiratory status. And the assessment and plan, you want to summarize it in a very succinct and also thoughtful way uh, with the fluid findings, likely etiology, pending tests, and a plan for further management. More information that you can get, um, there's a really great 
review article in the New England Journal of Medicine that Dr. Light wrote. And also there's a great series on JAMA, on the Rational Clinical Examination, which is highly recommended. So for the Yale 20, I'm Jeff Connors. And I'm Dennis Chung.